I knew him when he was a very shy student and a very shy young priest. When he was first ordained, he was sent to me at St. Mary's in the Hill in Augusta where I was pastor, and he was my assistant for two years, a very docile assistant, uh, very trustworthy. He didn't have a car when he started out, and he got a bicycle and rode around the parish at the beginning. That was something I had done myself years before. We Irish are usually rather good cyclists. John Paul, Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God. To the beloved son, John Kevin Boland, priest and vicar general of the Diocese of Savannah, and also pastor of the parish of St. Anne in the town of Columbus, appointed bishop of the same see of Savannah. We have judged it to be best if we place you, beloved son, in charge of it. I was chosen from your midst, and on this day I pledge you my support and my presence, that together we may continue to be instrument of the Lord's love in his work in this diocese. I, I think the secret of any pastoring, uh, whether it be the priest in the parish or the bishop, is to allow things happen, you know, to, to let people's gifts be made available to the church and, uh, and not to become so obsessed with the idea that you've got them all yourself and that they won't happen unless I give permission for them to happen. And obviously there's parameters within which we work our ministry, but those parameters when it comes to the spirit are, are very flexible and very wide in so many areas. And to encourage people to participate in the life of the church is not only going to enrich their own lives personally, it enriches the church. And if I may say so, it redounds to the benefit of the bishop. In the words of the boy Jesus, in the temple at 12 years of age, speaking to Mary and Joseph, did you not know I must be about my father's business? We proceed with this ordination rite, and all are called to enter into the sacredness of the moment. We will ordain Ben, Mike, and Steve to the order of priesthood, because not unlike the boy Jesus, they also want to be about their father's business. I want to wish everyone in Savannah, whether they're Irish or not, the happiest of St. Patrick's days. And as we heard at the Mass this morning, on this day we're all Irish. And we all have values no matter where we come from in the world. And today we celebrate with the Irish, tomorrow we'll celebrate with someone else. But God loves all of mankind, but today we think he loves the Irish in a special way. <laughs> Our big uh, banner, the Jubilee year, yeah. <laughs> and I held it towards the photographer so that I can get a photograph of it. But we won't have it for our groups now, but that's okay. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's marvelous. Where you get to the top of uh -huh. You can go up there, but it's a staircase that goes under the roof, like this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh. There's my statues up there. There's people up there. Yeah. This morning we are gathered at one of those thresholds immediately to the rear of me. You're looking right at it, is the tomb of St. Peter. Immediately below the high altar of this magnificent basilica named in his honor. So we're very privileged to come to this holy place where the apostles Peter and Paul 
sent forth the word of faith, and 2,000 years later, we gather in their memory and to profess our faith, the faith that has come from them. Now, at this time, I'd like to present or actually return back to you the key to the cathedral. Thank you very much. Before you acknowledge him with appreciation, I just want Father O'Neill to stand. Hold it. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, hold it. Please don't disobey your bishop. I have something to tell you. I wrote to the Pope about Father O'Neill, and as of this moment, he is a Monsignor in the Catholic Church. St. Catherine's Island, of course, is part and parcel of this territory of South Georgia, as all the barrier islands are. And so, in a certain sense, this is the beginnings of Catholicism in South Georgia, and in this part of, in this part of the United States, in fact. So from that point of view, this is not only sacred soil, but from a historical point of view, it's of great significance as to who we are today. It's called the Pope Mobile. Oh, is it? Well, yes. I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> Might be the Pope shot, huh? Yeah. yeah. It um, has a, lo there's a long story there. The vast majority of these Hispanic workers are Catholic. I have said before that if you travel South Georgia, you will find many McDonough's, O'Sullivan's, and Fitzgerald's who are not Catholic today because the church was not present to them when they arrived in this state to help build the canals and railroads in the 1800s. My great fear is that the same thing will happen in our time when a large segment of our Catholic community will not know the love and concern of the church because we were not able to be there for them or able to communicate with them. In these present moments of darkness, horror, evil, loss, we are here to pray for our beloved dead, to extend sympathy and consolation to the living victims, to offer support, encouragement, and gratitude to those bringing comfort and hope to a people whose lives are forever changed. It was the interview given by Ted Olson, the Solicitor General of the United States. His wife, Barbara, was on the airliner that crashed into the Pentagon. In that interview, he indicated that he and Barbara had talked on two different occasions during the final moments of that flight. She had put off her journey for her trip to the West Coast from Monday to Tuesday, because Tuesday was her husband's birthday. And she wanted to be there just for a little while on Tuesday morning before they parted their ways. He went to work early Tuesday, and Barbara shortly afterwards left for the airport to join her flight. In their conversation on the cell phone, they extended their love for each other, not really fully knowing at that time the tragic happening that was about to take place. 
What she did indicate in her self-resolve, is there anything I can tell the pilot what to do? Moments after that final conversation, the plane crashed into the Pentagon. And Bob Olson knew that he had lost his wife. As he indicated in the interview, he had a very, very difficult day. And it was late Tuesday, in fact, one o'clock Wednesday morning by the time he got home. And there was a note on his pillow indicating from his wife, Barbara, I love you. We'll be back on Thursday. Happy birthday. And the interviewer asked Ted Olson, what do you want to do about all of this? And his reply was, I don't want revenge. I want to suffer the moment with the thousands of others who have also lost their lives. This year we celebrated John Cuddy's 50th anniversary to priesthood in Macon. Jerry and I were there and I was speaking with him afterwards and I said, uh, how long should I have this reflection tonight? And he said offhandedly, about half the time that the bishop spoke at John Cuddy's. <laughs> Since the bishop uh, spoke for half an hour, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he spoke for an hour. <laughs> I have no agenda coming into the office except the agenda initially to be a bishop as best I can and to discern with the people where we go as church. That it's a, a ministry that we do together and I'm a facilitator or a leader in it. Oh, he'll be a bishop they can deal with. We'll listen to them, bear with them in their troubles and support them in the various enterprises. I expect he will make a very good bishop.